invite you to open a Bible to Philippians chapter 1, starting at verse 12. And as we prepare our hearts and minds to receive and hear God's word, we go to him in prayer. Our first prayer this morning is for our own hearts and minds that the Holy Spirit would speak to us through God's word and comfort and encourage us in our faith. Our second prayer this morning is for our brothers and sisters in Christ, the Holy Spirit would open their hearts to hear and receive God's word, that they would be encouraged and uplifted in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And finally, I ask that you pray for me that I would preach faithfully and truthfully the word of God and boldly proclaim the gospel of Jesus for all people to hear. Psalm 19 says, may the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be acceptable and pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. So Philippians chapter 1 has incredibly famous verses in it. We're going to start at verse 21, the end of our epistle reading this morning. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. How many of you have heard that verse before? All right, anybody been to a conference or a camp or a retreat where it was used as the theme and it's just proclaimed boldly, right? And everybody wants to proclaim it boldly. We want to join with Paul and say, absolutely, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. C.S. Lewis uh, talks about this verse and this concept where he says, lots of people will talk about being willing to die for their Savior, but they're not so much willing to live for their savior, right? And so Paul, Paul says this beautiful verse, this encouraging, uplifting verse, and says, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. So what I wanna do this morning is focus on that first part where he says, for me to live is Christ. Where my whole life, Paul is saying, is about living for Jesus, bringing him glory, bringing him fame, meaning his life is all about Jesus. And Paul doesn't care about the rest of his life, his reputation. That's what we're going to see in this text this morning. So how do we get to a point where we can join Paul and not just memorizing the verse, but really meaning the verse that's saying, yes, my life is about Jesus. So we go back to verse 12 of Philippians chapter 1. Paul says, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. So the what has happened to Paul is that he's been arrested. And the reason he's been arrested is because people told him to be quiet about Jesus, and Paul said no. And he just kept going from door to door, from city to city, talking about Jesus until he got into enough trouble that they put him into a Roman prison, and he's awaiting trial. And so he writes this letter, and so he's saying, here's what's happened to me. I've been persecuted, I've been mistreated, and I've been imprisoned because I would not be silent about Jesus. And the first lesson is, here's why Paul can say, for to me to live is Christ. He says, all that's happened to me, which would be a rough day, right? If, you would, if that happened to you, none of us would say, everything is going according to plan. Everything's going the way I want it to. It's smooth sailing, right? Um, I had a friend in Houston that his belief for a very long time in his life was if you just believe in Jesus, everything else will just work out, All right? And if you've been a Christian for a little while, you know that not everything works out according to your plans, right? How many of you have come to that wise realization already? So if you're Paul, his plan is, I'm going to share the gospel. I'm going to tell people about Jesus. I'm going to start churches. I'm going to go from city to city. And guess what happens? That plan eventually gets interrupted, and he's falsely and unfairly imprisoned, and that's where he's at now. And he's saying, but here's why I'm okay with it. Here's why I could say for my life is all about Jesus. Because in verse 12, he says, it has really served to advance the gospel. So what does Paul care about? Getting out of prison? He doesn't mention that. What he cares about is more people 
are hearing the gospel. The gospel is advancing into the world because of my imprisonment. Therefore, Paul says, I'm okay with my circumstances. I'm okay with my situation. Because it's a situation, it's a circumstance that is leading to the advancement of the gospel. So the first step to getting to the point where we can confidently say verse 21 and join Paul in that awesome boldness of faith is saying, what I care most about in life is the advancement of the gospel. That the gospel goes forth and more people hear about Jesus. Now, I know we're in church, and the correct answer, anybody ever been in church at Sunday school and you know the real answer and the right answer, and then there's the one that's actually in your heart? <laughs> okay, sometimes there's discrepancy there. We know the right answer is to go, amen, Paul. As long as the gospel goes forth, I'm okay with difficult circumstances, things not going to plan, things not going the way I want. But I'm a pastor, and even I have to admit, I wrestle with this text. <laughs> well, Paul, I would really like it if things just worked out. Paul, I would really like it if my prayers were answered the way I wanted them to be answered. I would like it if my prayers were answered in the timing that I wanted the timing it to be. There's all kinds of things where I can say, no, 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 Jesus, yeah, he's important, but I really need all this other stuff to go my way. And Paul, writing from prison, writing from an incredibly difficult circumstance, says, here's what matters. What has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it's become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And so he's saying, they know why I'm here. The, the Roman guards, the whole palace, everybody knows why I'm here, and it's because of Jesus. And so Paul's saying, the gospel's going out, and people are hearing about Jesus. Later on, he's going to say, therefore I rejoice. See, when we orient our lives, like Paul does, around making it about Jesus and his gospel, going out to as many people as possible, You'll be able to, like Paul say, well, my circumstances are difficult, things aren't going the way I want them, but I can still rejoice because people are learning about Christ. I can confidently say, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Why? Because people are hearing about Jesus. And then he goes on and he says, it's not only for him that he's able to rejoice, more people are rejoicing because of his re uh, imprisonment. In verse 14, most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So he's saying his faithfulness in difficult circumstances is pouring out into the lives of people around him. Right? Sometimes when we talk about evangelism and being a witness for the gospel, most people that I meet default to a picture of a man like John the Baptist running around preaching fiery sermons, sharing the gospel boldly, or someone like Paul who's willing to get arrested and for the gospel and boldly proclaim in public who Jesus is. How many of you personally feel like John the Baptist? How many of you are a little more reserved? Right, yeah. <laughs> I, I would imagine most of us are like, yeah, I like what John said, I just don't know if I'm going to be the one out there in the wilderness with him yelling like a crazy person. I'll back him up. I'll cheer for him, right? What Paul is saying is a lot of the brothers and sisters in the faith have grown in their faith and are more willing to boldly share the gospel because of my imprisonment. Because of his faithfulness in difficult circumstances, that itself became a witness to the people around him. So when it comes to witnessing and sharing the gospel and encouraging others in faith, it doesn't have to be all the time you going out and preaching the gospel and you um, acting like John the Baptist and like Paul and going to public places and just shouting the, the word of the Lord. Sometimes it looks like a quiet, confident faith in difficult circumstances where people go, wow, 
Look at them. They're going through this difficulty. They're going through this hardship, and yet they are still holding on to faith in Jesus. They are still trusting in his promises. So I want to encourage you in that, that your form of witnessing and evangelism might be very quiet. It might be reserved because it might look like Paul in prison saying, but just because my circumstances are difficult, I can still rejoice in the love of God. And because of this, he says, most of the brothers and sisters have become more confident in their faith. It might be a quiet witness to the people around you. And then he gets this interesting part where not everybody likes Paul. Verse 15 says, some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaimed Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. So verse 17, he's saying, there's this group of people that are going around proclaiming the gospel in order to cause more pain and difficulty for Paul's life. It's completely unfair. It's completely wrong. It's completely unjust. And yet, we're going to see how Paul responds, which is not the natural inclination of most of our hearts, probably. Most of us would say, well, we gotta get them to be quiet. (laughs) We gotta get them to knock it off. We gotta get them to change their attitudes because they're causing problems. They're doing all this stuff that's unfair, causing all kinds of pain and sorrow for Paul. And yet, in verse 18, he says, what then? Meaning, what should I do about it? And his answer is, only that in every single way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed And in that, I rejoice. So Paul's saying, I don't care if they're doing it out of love for me. I don't care if they're doing it for uh, false reasons or false pretense. As long as the name of Jesus and the gospel is going out, he says, I'm going to rejoice. Now here's why that's so amazing. He's in prison, which is unpleasant already, And yet, they are causing him to have even more trouble, more difficulty while he's in prison. He goes, I'm okay with that because the gospel is going out. And this is why you can get to verse 21, where Paul says, for me to live is Christ. And he really means it. Because for Paul, his life is not about his circumstances. His life is not about what he's going through. His life is all about, is Jesus being made much of? Is the gospel advancing into the world? And people could look at it and go, well, Paul, you're you're crazy. Like, this is a tough circumstance, and you did the right thing. You did what God wanted you to do, and you ended up in prison. You did the right thing, and yet people are doing this thing to cause you issues and cause you problems, and yet you're going, I'm going to rejoice about it. Right? The the letter of Philippians uses the word joy and rejoice dozens of times, and Paul is writing from all these difficult circumstances. He says, yeah, but I'm still going to have joy. I'm still going to rejoice. He says it twice. Yes, and I will rejoice, (laughs) just in case people didn't believe him. And why is he able to do that? And why are you and I able to do that? Because for Paul, the whole core of his life, the whole center focus of his life is Jesus. Is the gospel going out? So what I want to do today is how do you and I live like that? How do you and I live for Christ in our daily lives? The Bible calls it spiritual gifts, and we're not all going to end like like Paul. We're not all going to end up sharing the gospel from prison like he did, but I want to encourage you with a couple of verses that show how you and I, in our everyday lives, can make it about Jesus. It can have joy and rejoicing in difficult circumstances, knowing that Jesus is being made much of. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, The apostle Peter writes this, he says, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. 
See, in Paul's letter of Philippians, he's writing to this church that encouraged him with prayers, helped support him with generous giving, and served him in all kinds of physical needs that he had while he was in prison. And that's why he's rejoicing in his difficult circumstances. And Peter's saying, you and I have received a gift. So if you believe in Jesus, do me a favor and raise your hand right now. Cool. You have received a gift, right? Peter's not saying only some people or only the apostle Paul have received a gift. He's saying, no, everybody's received a gift to serve the church and to serve Jesus with. And he's saying, I want you to use it to serve other people, to do what the Philippian church did for Paul, what Paul did for the Philippian church, that they used their various gifts that God had given to them to build each other up in the faith so that when they are facing difficult circumstances and hardships, Paul is able to say, I can rejoice because I know the gospel is advancing. And the church of Philippi can rejoice because they know that even though Paul's going through hardships, the gospel is advancing and they're serving one another. Now here's the deal. You've heard of Paul. We don't know much about the people of Philippi, right? I want you to think about it that way. But because of the people at Philippi, we have this letter and Paul was sustained in his ministry. He was uplifted in prayer. He was financially supported. He was physically supported with food and other gifts. And because of that, he was able to write other letters and keep his ministry going. Another way to think about it is there's all kinds of people that have been gifted by God that have served the gospel and served Jesus that we've never heard of. But they've made a tremendous difference in the world. Earlier this week was All Saints Day, a day where we give thanks to God and remember all the saints that have gone before us. And some are really famous, like Paul, and others are like the people at Philippi that we don't know their names. But what Peter says about every single one of us, whether it's Paul or you and me, is each has received a gift, and he encourages us to use it to serve one another as stewards of God's very grace. He's saying, whatever your gift is, You can make your life about Jesus by using that gift to serve others in the church and outside of the church. So the example I use often, because it's simple and it's easy for you to remember, is people go, well, Pastor Mark, I can't teach the Bible like you do. And I always tell them, good. And then you're all offended. And I don't mean to offend you by that. (laughs) And it's not an arrogant thing of like, wow, I'm really awesome at what I do. Okay, it's good because Peter says it's a varied grace and each has received their gifts. So I want you as your pastor to use your gifts the way God has gifted you and not sit there going, well, I wish I had this one or I wish I had that one or I can't do this. He's like, no, 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 use your gifts to serve others, right? On the front pews today, we have quilts from our group of Uh, men and women that get together to make quilts throughout the year to help support orphan grain training. Guess what I can't do? So, I can't do it. I can't even put a button back on a shirt. If a button falls off my shirt, I'm buying a new shirt. It's just, that's how desperate I am, okay? But there are people that are able to use their very gifts of grace that God has given them to serve others and help people learn about the love of Jesus. Another example of this comes from our gospel reading with a man named Theophilus. Now there's a very good chance that wasn't his real name, because Theophilus means lover of God or friend of God, so it might have been a nickname that was given to him after he came into faith. But what we know about him from church history is that he was a generous benefactor of uh, St. Luke, who wrote Luke in Acts. That's all we know about Theophilus. He loved God and he was wealthy. That's it. But we have the book of Luke and the book of Acts because of him. So I just want you to think about this for a moment. All we know about Theophilus is he loved God, he was wealthy. But because of his generosity, because he was using the gifts that God had given to him, think about how much you know about Jesus because of Theophilus. You have the whole book of Luke. You have the whole book of Acts. Without Theophilus, we don't get either one of those. So here's the point. 
Sometimes we think of saints, we think of people like St. Paul, we go, wow, look what he did for Jesus. But there's also saints like the church at Philippi. There's the saints that make the quilts. There's the saints like Theophilus that we don't know anything about, but because of them, we know a whole lot about Jesus. And ultimately, that's what it looks like to live Philippians 1, verse 21, where Paul says, for to me to live is Christ. Whether it was in good circumstances or difficult circumstances, whether people were doing good things for him or bad things towards him, Paul says, all I care about is that more people learn about Jesus. So when you and I as a church get together and use our very gifts, that's what it looks like to live for Christ. Whether it's our ability to make quilts, whether it's our ability to be prayer warriors like the Philippians were for Paul, whether it's our ability to be generous with the wealth God has given us like Theophilus, as whatever we are gifted with, he's saying, I want you to use it to live for Jesus, to make your life about Jesus, to make it so that your goal is, I want more people to know about the love of God through Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks for the many gifts that you have given to us. We thank you for the saints like St. Paul and the church at Philippi and Theophilus who did so many things so that we today could know so much about you and that we could join them in rejoicing in your salvation. Lord Jesus, use us as your servants and your, your saints today to use our very gifts that you have given to us so that more people will know about Jesus and his love and his salvation. Your name we pray. Amen.